Okay. Um, welcome everybody to this session on new data to understand a complex world. I think we are really living in very turbulent times um, and data can really help us to solve a lot of our big challenges we have. Unfortunately, we are really delayed in this session um, and I would urge the speakers to try to maybe even cut a little bit your presentations uh, a few minutes if, if possible because um, if we are all so hungry, we will not be able to absorb all this really great information. Um, so I still hope, and I don't want to do much ado at this point, um, I hope that your hunger for science is stronger than your hunger you currently have, and you can bear for a while absorbing this really interesting and exciting information you will get from five um, excellent speakers. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Chris Brunston. Um, he has done very interesting work on COVID and the pandemic, uh, which he wants to share with us. He is the director of the Irish Center for Geocomputation, National Center for Geocomputation, and he's also a professor there at the, the University of Maynooth. So welcome, uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan, and uh, happy birthday to IASA, and thank you all for uh, inviting me here. Um, can you all hear me? Good. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, um, what I want to talk about today is um, COVID forensics, as I call it. And part of the point here is perhaps thinking about um, some of the things that have been said about how, you know, prediction is all very well, but it's also quite important to understand processes. And some of that we had to do in real time as the epidemic was uh, evolving, but some other things we have now an opportunity to um, deal with in terms of um, reflection and looking at some of the things that happened in terms of the process. And that's kind of why I'm thinking about it in a sort of forensic uh, viewpoint. And I guess, uh, as Stefan said, I'm uh, director of the National Center for Geocomputation, so there's a geo in the term there, which is perhaps my, my own personal take on that, goes towards a spatial view, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so my background is here. I'm going to be talking a bit about the COVID-19 epidemic in Ireland, uh, although hopefully some of the ideas can be transferred to, to other places. Um, and that's partly because I was involved in modeling that at the time in this um, group called IMAG, IEMAG, uh, the Irish Epidemic Modeling Advisory Group. So they've got some sort of personal reflections on that and also some um, practical examples relating to that. So those are the sort of things that I want to uh, talk about uh, now. So um, again, um, some of the aims which I think have already been uh, discussed is um, one of them is transparency. If I'm doing things in terms of the data analysis, as well as talking about the data, I'm going to talk a bit about how it was analyzed, then I think it is important to do that in an open way so that people know the methods that have been used for the transparent um, forms of communication. So um, one thing then is possibly my peers to be able to see the way I've analyzed the data. So I've tried wherever possible to use open software and to make, uh, or to make use of data that is widely available. And I guess uh, one of the things I'd like to do as well as that is just to generally stress the, uh, stress the importance of data being broadly uh, available. Um, and still uh, maintain some sort of inferential principles in terms of statistical modeling, but also to be aware that although that is the case, um, a lot of the sort of historical ideas about statistical inference were uh, based on using sort of designed experiments and things and not on dealing with an unexpected situation as it, unfold, as it unfolds. That's almost the exact opposite of a, uh, a designed experiment. And that's what a lot of people are facing uh, at the moment. And again, uh, in times like these, as Stefan suggested, that's something we need to think about. Um, but um, what I do want to also be able to do is allow some flexibility in the models and the analytical techniques that have been uh, adopted here. And also um, allow some flexibility in terms of 
when I'm analyzing the data, some of the quantities that are estimated, and also into the questions you can ask. One of the problems, if you like, with using a lot of the out-of-the-box statistical techniques is there are certain numbers of hypotheses you can test. Um, and certainly you can test other ones, but the ready available software solutions don't always let you do that. Um, and that sometimes doesn't help when you know, you've got real world questions evolving quite, uh, quite rapidly. So to be adaptive in the analytical approaches is quite important here. Um, and one way to do this, and I'm not saying it's the only one, is to use a statistical tool called STAN. Now, STAN is basically um, sort of involved in what you might call probabilistic computation. Uh, it uses a Bayesian approach, uh, for those of you that have used that. And um, the key thing here is uh, a Bayesian approach, uh, well, there isn't time to explain the whole thing here, but uh, when you're trying to estimate certain quantities, it enables you to do so using what's called a posterior distribution, which given some data and a set of prior beliefs which can be expressed as being neutral, um, then you get a posterior probability distribution of the things that you're interested in. Uh, and what Stan does is rather than work these out analytically, it simulates draws from those computations and um, enables you to um, make estimates on the basis of those. Um, what you get in return for being able to do, use this simulation-based approach is a very flexible model specification. Again, we don't just use ones we know the analytical solution for. And particularly because I'm interested in spatial patterns, it makes it uh, easy to incorporate those. Uh, and then there's a link at the bottom, so if the uh, slides are made uh, subsequently available, you can follow that and find out if you're interested a little more about that. The other point is, as an analytical tool, it links easy to R, which is an open source um, statistical analysis uh, toolkit programming language, or also to Python, for those of you who use that. Uh, and a very important data source I've used here, since we are talking about data, is the, the COVID-19 data hub that I've um, mentioned here, which is funded by the Institute for Data Valorization, Avido, uh, Avido in, uh, in Canada. And you can download data from this census, uh, from this, uh, this data set, this center, and uh, also, um, you can um, download it via a software package you can use in uh, R, so it makes it easy to sort of plumb it in to existing data analysis. And it's, um, it's quite a unified data source because what it does is essentially it enables you to um, uh, link together data from lots of different countries uh, and it tries wherever possible to harmonize those data. So uh, that's an important data tool. Again, uh, if, the data become, if the slides become available, there's a couple of references that will tell you more about that data. But it's a, a very important data source for understanding about COVID. And one of the things you can start off by doing is, is visualize it and use tools to see what's going on, um, which hopefully communicate things. And what I've done here is um, just visualized some of the early days of COVID in my, uh, from that data. Um, and what this does here, I've um, subdivided Dub uh, Ireland into its relative counties, the Republic of Ireland that is, and then the size of these circles here represent the, the number of cases reported and the, uh, the x-axis there is the date. So you can see growing cases of COVID across Ireland and as you can see it's sort of um, started to appear in some places earlier than others. What's also quite interesting is it seemed to sort of kick in in different places at different times. And what I'm interested in here, in this forensic part of what I'm looking at, is the early days of the epidemic. So from about March the 2nd or the beginning of March uh, until the end of March in Ireland, and what sort of happened in terms of COVID then. And what we want to learn a bit about there, I suppose, is A, what we might expect to happen should there be uh, another kind of pandemic in a similar way, uh, and also, um, you know, link that to some other variables to get some idea of what's going on. Now, I, I also would argue that things like agent-based modeling will help here, but um, what we want to do is to some way validate those models, and being able to link it to these patterns and see how well it's reproduced them is important to understanding what uh, we're actually uh, trying to do here. So that's sort of what's going on, and I'd say the main thing is you can see steady growth. You can also see Dublin kicked off 
further, uh, quicker than some of the other places. And you can also see that um, there seems to be sometimes a sort of lower or later kick-in period uh, than other places as well. So those are sort of things we want to investigate here. Um, a very basic mathematical model then is to uh, have what's called a Poisson regression model. Again, in the time here, I won't explain one if you don't know, but it's basically a little model that says that to some extent the number of cases links to the population of each of the counties. There's sort of an underlying base rate which would sort of happen naturally, which if it's the same for all counties, is just like the national rate at which the uh, illness was occurring. But to that, you have to add a multiplier for the number of days. So what this is doing effectively is it's saying that the rate of uh, COVID is sort of increasing exponentially, which over all of time isn't a sensible model. There are differential equation models that would show that, uh, you know, once uh, infection went up by a certain amount, people become immune and therefore it's harder to infect people and things do peak and then fall off again. But um, in the early days, which is the part we're interested in, then exponential is a, is a reasonable model. It isn't later on so, but because we're focusing on now, it's a, it's a starting point. Uh, and so that, that's why we're doing it uh, that, uh, that particular way. But the problem with that is that the, um, the parameters in that model make sense if you study statistical modeling, but perhaps don't so to people outside of there. So we want a couple of more sort of human interpretable numbers, one of which is the doubling time, which is the number of days you'd expect for the number of cases on average to, to double. And the other one is the mid-month case rate. So that for each county is the number of cases per million you're actually uh, witnessing. Now, those are perhaps easier ideas to communicate than the, the numbers in the model. So part of your problem is to make things more human interpretable. And this simulation-based approach that Stan uses means you can actually uh, get these as output from your model as well as the, uh, the more sort of statistical parameters. And um, when you fit those, um, you can see, first of all, the first two columns there are the mid-month rate, which is about 11.6 per million over the whole of Ireland, and the doubling rate, which was about just over five days. Um, there are also ways of getting um, upper and lower limits, a bit like confidence intervals. It's Bayesian, so they aren't actually confidence intervals. And you can see there that the mid-month rate is between about 10.9 something and 12.3 and the doubling rate between about 4.96 and 5.4. So you've got some idea of the reliability of those estimates. Now, uncertainty, I would totally agree with what's been said before, is something that's incredibly difficult to communicate, particularly to people who don't want to hear you communicating about it. So um, that's um, you know, something I, I understand. I kind of hope that by putting things at least in terms of parameters people understand, then um, you know, that, that, might, um, that might help. Although I would also argue that one of the big problems with communication is more than just thinking about things like fuzzy set theory, it's as much a problem of linguistics as well. You can say something in one way and convey the same information numerically about uncertainty in another way and get very different reactions. So it's about that as well as all the other things that have rightfully been raised. Uh, and just to argue then, I've put the other two parameters there just to show that they're harder really to make any um, uh, ob obvious sense of. Um, I then sort of um, looked at the model by keeping <coughs> the, um, the doubling time about the same, uh, sorry, keeping the doubling time fixed in my model for all counties, but allowing the base rates to, to change. And in this case, that would mean also that the cases per million in the mid-month changed. And that's the result of the map you can see there. And what that's basically saying is that the rates in Dublin were quite a bit higher than everywhere else. And possible the, the issue there is it's not just about the uh, underlying population density. That, that doesn't make things necessarily rise simply linearly. It probably does something more than linear because the chances of people coming into contact with people within a small radius also increases. And that probably isn't linear, that's more likely possible permutations, which would be something higher than a linear rate, which possibly is explained by that, uh, that map there. Uh, we can also put um, the doubling time to be um, different from place to place. And what's quite interesting there is uh, when you do that in this model, you see that the um, that, that actually Dublin wasn't the highest in terms of the increase in rate, but on the other hand, it was still 
the, uh, the, the, the one that had the most, uh, the most cases there. So sometimes there might be things that cause the doubling time to change other than simply uh, the, um, the population density. Um, now in all of these, uh, again, due to time, I won't show you the code now, but um, if you do see a version of these, uh, these slides that's uh, accessible, then if you click on the thing that says see stand code there, it'll make the code come down, if, again, if you're interested. If not, then hopefully you're just interested in the, in the maps anyway. Um, we also note that their population density does seem to, to link uh, to those, and the only outlier in there is possibly, again, Dublin on the graph on your um, right, as you're facing the, the screen, where you can see it didn't have such a high doubling time, but it did have um, a, um, a, you know, that, that one is that by far the most high uh, population density. But also, for the mid-month rate, it definitely was the highest, and that's, you know, when you take into account its per head of population. Um, we'll skip that one. Um, the next point is I noticed that there was, as I say, uh, a model about change points as well. And what I've done here is effectively modified my model, uh, again, without going too much into the mathematics. I modified the model so that essentially at a certain day, the, uh, the rate started to raise exponentially and there was a sort of period before that cut in where there was just a sort of underlying background base rate without that happening. Now, in some places, Places, that's possibly because the, uh, the number of people that um, were actually infected were, um, it, it was actually zero for a point until someone came to that place. The problem with a lot of these sort of, um, you know, the, these kind of continuous differential equation based, equation based models is they assume things are continuing, as of course in the early days they aren't because they're integer numbers and quite small integers. And um, that's possibly where you need to sort of think about things in a slightly different way. What also happened with some places is you did get one or two cases reported, but that the people were actually uh, being very obedient in terms of things like uh, isolation and so forth. So that um, basically, even though someone was reported, they didn't go out and then no further cases were spread. So allowing for that, you even got a few places where there was a, slow, a low background base rate, but not, uh, not a very high one. And we were basically interested, therefore, in finding out in different places where the kind of cutoff point where things started to go exponential was. And that's what this model allows you to do. And so if we do that, we look at the takeoff uh, rate. And again, there we see that the lighter places were the places where the takeoff was actually um, uh, lower. And uh, sorry, the, yeah, the lighter places where the, the takeoff was later into the month, the darker places are where it happened soonest. And here you can see that that happened most in, um, in Dublin. That was, uh, it only took about, to about the 4th of March for things to take off there. And again, places, some, one of the places where the, um, the overall change rate was highest was actually uh, one that it took a long while to take off. And what seemed to happen there was there was suddenly uh, a takeoff that happened quite rapidly, but uh, not until quite late on into the month. And again, uh, using that model, we can also estimate the number of cases per million in the mid-month uh, time. And again, in that one, Dublin is still the highest. And some of those are very low there because some places actually didn't take off until quite late into the month. And that's why um, some places are very low on the cases per million mid-month because, uh, you know, at the far end, some places had barely taken off by uh, the 15th or 16th of March. They were still on quite low rates. Um, and I was talking about the importance of um, communicating things in a non-technical way. So I've caused a big bad here by uh, so labeling this slide negative binomial. Uh, what I'm trying to do here, though, is use a slightly different model for the data. In the first one, it sort of assumes that each case of, um, of, of COVID is independent of any others, whereas, of course, in reality, they will come in small clumps, for example, households or workplaces. And what a negative binomial model does, without going into too much detail, it is another model for small counts of things, but it allows for things more to move in clusters. So if you infect a household, that'll be three cases, and you know, you, rather than each case being independent, they won't be because we know that the, um, the cases uh, in households could well be just communicated one to another. And so that's the reason we put the, this, this part of the model in. And effectively, what I've done there is slightly modified my anal analytical model to allow for this. And this 
quite technical slide here is basically saying that the, the clustering effect is a parameter. When it's zero, that means there's no bunching, so things are independent. But when it's greater than zero, then um, there is some degree of bunching. Now, this is a harder one. I'm still working on, an, on a way of trying to make that number more interpretable. But we can see there that the estimates are somewhere between about 0.5 something and just about 0.9 with uh, a typical uh, value of about 0.7, which means it's pretty unlikely to be zero. So it suggests that there is some argument for using this in the model to allow for that. And again, that's something that could be carried forward for using for things like agent-based models, that you know, people living in the same household get some idea of, of sort of cross-infection uh, according to that. So uh, that's, that's sort of the only change to the model. There's all the other parameters that I used before can be interpreted in the same way. Um, and then a final extra source of interesting data is that from Google movement data. Now this is something that Google um, released, and it's basically uh, based on um, locations from people's phones, but it's fairly um, anonymized. So it's really just looking at things like the amount of time people are in these uh, six different types of locations. So um, grocery and farmery, pharmacy, parks, transit stations, retail and recreation, residential or workplaces. And in particular, for this data, I was interested in the, the workplaces one. Now that data isn't perfect. Um, for a start, uh, you know, I've talked about openness. We don't know exactly how Google, I don't know, generally people don't know exactly how this was uh, calculated. And it's not available for all places. But on the other hand, it is available. And at the time, you know, when we were looking at COVID, then um, it was something that was of um, importance to, to analyzing that. So although it doesn't meet all the criteria I've said, I guess it's a case in reality of not letting perfect become the enemy of, of good, that you know, we had to, to make use of it, and there it was. And in a nutshell, one of the things I did was I took the movement uh, data for uh, where people were in terms of their houses, and I did a sort of cluster analysis, and it came into four groups. Now, all of the four groups were quite similar. This was basically an index saying how much time people were spending in their, in their homes. And as I say, there were four, whoops, uh, clusters, and um, the, um, the four clusters basically, um, thank you, uh, were um, basically telling you which group of movement they were. And largely speaking, they did just tend to group things into the, the, this. I was looking at the whole month, but the patterns were the same over most of the month. It was just some places that were more inclined to move than others. And those are the four groups it fell into. And very finally, we can actually look at things like the estimate of the change point versus the degree of movement. And what we can see there is, well, actually, Dublin was in a cluster of its own, which was the, um, the highest amount of movement. And that was the one also where things took off um, quickest. And cluster group four, which if we go back there, was actually the second highest one. It's that sort of purple one. Um, was um, basically the, um, the second uh, highest group. And you can see the top half of that um, set of uh, estimates of cut-in dates is dominated by the, um, the first um, four, uh, for, by the first two clusters, and the other two tend to be more towards the, the rear end. Um, we can do the same for the, the midpoint rate, which is largely linked also to the, the cut-in date anyway. And again, fairly similar story is told. Certainly, you don't see so many of the greens and the purples down the um, bottom end of the, of the plot. And the, the reds and the turquoise ones come in more there, where um, the, um, there are a few exceptions, but that, that's sort of generally what's, what's going on. So these allowed you to get some sort of insight into what's going on there. So that's a bit of the, um, uh, the examples of some of the things I've been doing there. I'll, I'll stop there, but just to make a few concluding remarks. Um, I think it is quite an important task to identify the geography of the early spread, partly because you know, we have hospitals and intensive care units spread around Ireland, and we, know, we need to know which ones are likely to need to uh, respond first. And that's something I think that's transferable to, to other countries. Um, it just so happens I live in Ireland, so it was asked to look at it there. Um, and uh, it certainly does seem to be linked to relative levels of movement. Now, again, I think looking at the, um, you know, there's a lot of social issues around this. You know, we, we need to think about this perhaps from a bottom up more than a top down rate. So, for example, people who don't have nice gardens to go to go more to public spaces and things like that. There's a lot of social drivers to that. 
Um, the movement patterns themselves seem to be quite similar in profile over time, but just different in scale. And again, the urban areas seem to be some of the ones that had the highest levels of movement, even though the patterns were the same. Again, possibly because of things like uh, the ones I was talking about, and it needs probably a lot more social science to understand that. Um, but looking at the parameters and allowing to vary over space does help our understanding. Um, so I think, you know, I was justified in using geography as one lens to view all of this, if not the only one. Um, and finally, uh, I still would like to re-emphasize the importance of using openly available data and open software so that the techniques that anyone uses can be scrutinized and, um, you know, hopefully constructively uh, changed in certain circumstances to learn more and so that the knowledge can be more easily passed on. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Th thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I'm sure you have some questions, though maybe you can spare them for later. We will have a plenary session later, if that's okay. And also those who are remotely connected, um, you can post your questions um, there as well, and we collect them and we tackle them at the end. Um, we are unfortunately running late, sorry about that. Um, the next speaker is Wolfgang Fengler. He is the incoming CEO of the World Data Lab, an NGO here based in Vienna. Um, and he's going to talk about how to predict the future with data. Over to you, Wolfgang. Thank you so much, Steffen, and everybody at this very historic moment in a historic place. Maybe building on the previous presentation, what I'd like to, to do is to show you a bit how you can popularize data, how you can predict the future at a world at 8 billion, which just passed. And um, as you know, many of you are also the guests of YASA. YASA is the leading institution to do the, these projections. Uh, YASA should be proud that the UN starts to adjust uh, towards YASA projections. Maybe the YASA projection is still slightly different than this one, but still we live now at least in a popular uh, context in the world of 8 billion. What some of you in this room don't know is that actually YASA had a big role in helping World Data Lab get off the ground. Um, because we tried to popularize a few key things, including demography. Um, Samir KC is not, I think, in this room, but you know he works with Wolfgang Lutz. And we tried to answer one big question that you all have, that I have, which is how long will I live? And there's another question that we should have in life, which is how much money is around, how much money would we earn? And then the third question is, can we all sustain this? Uh, and again, today is still COP27, and I can show you something cool that we we'll launch tomorrow. So with that, um, um, I'll, I'll want to walk you through this presentation to answer these three questions. And I hope I'm doing this right. Yeah, so World Data Lab tries to combine the YASA world with the Silicon Valley. That's a simple thing. We want to make data and science cool, exciting, forward-looking, brave, bold, make some mistakes too, but just to, to, to make it for everybody, not just for these great experts in this room, everybody. Your aunt, your uncle, your niece, your nephew should love data. That's what we're trying to do. I hope I'm pressing the right button. Yeah. So um, how long will I live? Um, and that's not the first, uh, actually, that started seven years ago. Uh, as I said, with uh, Semi KC, I started this. I can show you the model. There's also a paper to that. But I want to use the exercise now. So if we could switch, uh, um, Regie, just to a website called Population.io, and then we'll do the exercise. Maybe do it with Stefan. Exactly. Uh, obviously, the world is now close to 8 billion, uh, again, at least in, in the YASA model. Um, and you could, I can tell you a lot of things about yourself. So, Stefan, if you give me your birthday, I'll tell you how long you live. What's your birthday? 11th of Kudu. Okay, 11th of Could you type in 11th? 11th in the day, it's Tag, 11th. Yeah, and then June. So, you go to June, June, uni, 1969. Stefan is actually from Germany, which is interesting itself. So let's put Germany here because that's the question. Is you, do you live longer in Germany or in Austria? Uh, I think you need to put Deutschland. Yeah, thank you. Just put Deutschland, männlich, yeah, on the right side. And then, yeah, then we'll get some result. The first result is a very depressing one. Stefan is older than 6.273 billion people in the world, but there's still 1.67 billion younger. Uh, so in the world, you look, but yeah, but that's interestingly, if you click to Deutschland, to Germany here, uh, so it's interesting, huh? uh, Stefan is 80 older than 80% of the world, but he's only older than 57% in Germany. That itself tells you something. But the next page, if you go just down one page, you see the interesting thing. Bill Gates used that. That's if you were just mathematicians and don't worry about, and assume Stefan has average health and average lifestyle, he would live another 31 years till April 13, 2054. 
And let's click or let's do in country. That's the exciting question now. Let's put in country Austria, Österreich, and see does he live longer in Austria or in Germany? And the answer is he lives longer in Austria. So all of you Austrians, be proud and happy. I still would like to know why. Maybe, <laughs> you see, smart moon. You can move almost to your next birthday then, uh, Stefan, July 11, uh, July 9. So if you work well, then I think you will have the, your birthday in 2054 as well. I know, July anyway, it's June. So you will celebrate the birthday in 2054, which is just 100 years after Germany was first won the World Cup, which is another reason to celebrate uh, in this context. So anyway, you can see, you can use science and make it exciting, but if you switch back to the presentation, some of the deeper meaning, and Stefan and myself and the team work actually a lot on the, on the SDG, so if you go on the next slide, uh, and let's link to SDG 3, right? Health, how long do we live? So if you go to the next slide, um, I think we just need to press the, oh no, sorry, I need to press the button, right? <laughs> it was giving the answer. Then you can ask a different question, which is how many people actually die? Die today, die this week, die this year? Any guess how many people die this year? It's actually uh, 68 million. Uh, it used to be over 60 million. With COVID, it's a bit more, 68 million. That's the number of deaths. And SDG, my SDG that we didn't fulfill is the one that we should not die below 65. Um, I think that would be a nice aim in the world. Or everybody should li live at least till retirement, but 28 million still live, don't, don't achieve that. Now, it's still a way better number than it's ever been, but still, 28 million. And that's, again, a number we should keep in our brains. It's a very important number. Why do 28 million people die below age 65? Next question is, where are these 28 million? And you know, it's not in Europe, it's not in Austria, it's not in the US, but it's also not dominantly in Africa. It's actually dominantly in Asia. Now, Africa has a much higher proportion of death below 65, but most people below 65 die in Asia. That's roughly half of the global number, but that number will go down and has started to go down. So again, you may have known all this, but it's a new perspective. If you put the numbers out very clearly, you get some of these insights and see that. And Africa, if you compare, most people in Africa die below age 65. But fortunately, more and more die above age 65. So that's one, one big shift, one different way to look at numbers. The other way where YASA is strong is to look again at the next big milestone. Today we are, seem to be at 8 billion. We will definitely reach 9 billion. I once actually wrote a piece with Samir, Samir on will the world reach 10 billion, which I think is still a big open question for all of us to understand. I know YASA says no, um, others say yes. Um, but here's again a simple way to think about demographic transitions. So far we had 4.5 births and 1.7 deaths. But that number is now, and it's not changing a lot, but these small changes matter over a long time. So interestingly, the death go up more, the birth also go down a bit. Why are the death going up? Not for bad reasons, for good reasons, because people, there's more people, and there's more old people, that's why death go up, so it's something almost inevitable. But that means till 2040 is the next big milestone. So we should celebrate this in a big way, because it'll be another 20 years, and it's then close to Stefan and my last period in life that we have the nine billion, but definitely will reach. Um, good, two more shifts on demography before I go to the second and then the third part, which is very short. Sorry, no, I wanted to show you this. Uh, why is there population growth still? You know, it's, it, it, fortunately, now the global community got the message right. We have a lot of more people, but it's not a problem, and it's a natural thing. Why is it natural? Because population growth, you all knew this, but I need to repeat it, ha is not driven by children. There's not more children today than there were 20 years ago. There will not be more children in the future than there are today. It's the same number. It's what Hans Rosling called peak child. Two billion, that's the number. It doesn't change. If anything, it would go down. Thanks to Africa, we are still stable. So why is the population growth? Well, very simple, because of us, us in this room. We are all adults. We create the population growth. We don't want to stop it, because otherwise we should do something rather, rather strange. So, we, should, we don't stop it, we live longer, that's why it's more people, let's live with that reality. Uh, and it's both, it's the working adults and it's the seniors which grow, um, obviously seniors disproportionately. Now let's go to the second part, it's a machine that you don't know so much, which is the money machine. They're created out of the demographic machine. Uh, I hope your institutions and your, uh, your universities can use it because it has all the segments of all the world and you can project anything, if you like, till 2034, and it's mostly about money. But the interesting thing is, it's one tipping point. Again, the world didn't notice. It just happened. Half the world is middle class or wealthier. 
So in a time of COVID, which you just heard the presentation, a time of the war in Russia, uh, I mean the war in Ukraine, um, and a lot of other problems and, and inflation, there is still a good news there, which is half the world for the first time ever um, is middle class or wealthier. So the right side of this is the middle class, the green part, the yellow part is the vulnerable part, and the, um, the red part is the poor part. Um, by the way, there has been a tipping point before in 2019. It was 3939 billion. Then because of COVID, it went down, but we are back there. Four billion, the first time ever in human history, four billion consumers. Will this number go down? No, the opposite. It's going to six billion by 2040. Um, and uh, if people ask, why is this a positive news in this bad time? The answer is there's two worlds. There's the European world and the Western world and our negative headlines, and there's the Asian world. And these are two different worlds. And there's not just China and India, but it's, it's the Bangladesh, it's the Pakistan, it's the Vietnams, it's the Indonesias, it's the Philippines, which just keep going, going, going and growing. And they don't do something spectacular. They had good policies in broad terms the last 20 years. And because people live longer, there's more consumers. Again, very simple, it comes back to demographics. That's why today we had 4 billion, 3.9 uh, to 4 billion, and uh, it will be at 6 billion in 2030. So if, you're global, if you work with global companies, if you help position them in the consumer goods, that's an area to think about. But look at this, it's the big green block that matters. It's the middle class, it's the lower middle class. It's not the rich, they don't, there are too few in the world to really matter in the consumer world. Um, at least, except in some segments in some countries. Good, so actually I'm going now to the next slide. I hope the thing doesn't hold, so if you otherwise help me and just move to the next slide so I can show you some nuances. What is surprising, again, about this year in terms of consumer class growth is how normal this year is, this yellow year. We will add, despite the headlines that I mentioned, 103 million people to the consumer class. How many of them are in Asia? Any guess? 80 million. It is an Asian dominance. It's 10 million in Africa and 10 million elsewhere. The only anormal, un unnormal years are 2020 and 2021. 2021 was the first time ever in the century the consumer class shrank. And again, it shrank in a context of a rising population. So the delta is even bigger because it should have gone up and not zero. And 2021 was exceptional because it was extremely strong recovery. The rest is very stable, around 100, 120 million, possibly 130. That's what, what some of the surprises is, just predictable, steady growth in the consumer class. Um, where is it? Um, as, a, as a context, and, and uh, Stefan knows this because he works a lot with Homi Karas as well, like I, Homi Karas from Brookings coined that term, the global consumer class. And why is it global? Why is it something new? Because it, there was no global consumer class 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a Western consumer class. And only then, very quickly, in the early 2000s, after China's accession to the WTO and the growth, you got some of all these Asian consumers and some African and, and some Latin American. And that's why all of that growth, at least in numbers, is driven by the emerging economies. Um, it's not yet driven by the money. Money, that tipping point is soon happening. So in terms of money, the West or the OECD still has more than the emerging economies, but in terms of numbers and people, the, um, the emerging economies have the driver, which again, you reflected here. You may ask, what is the consumer class? It's actually everybody spending more than roughly, uh, used to be $10, 10 euros, it's now $12, 12 euros, 2011 PPP, 2017 PPP. There's a lot of science behind this, we can discuss it, but uh, just assume there's a threshold and you can measure that across time and space, and then these are the numbers. Again, the numbers, as I showed you, go from four to six billion today, uh, but the message is it's the purple block. That purple block almost doubles, the other blocks stay same, except Africa that also triples actually, but from a very low base. And it's very important to get these proportions right. Again, for those of you connected to companies, Nestle made a very bad, big bet to Africa. They thought Africa is rising, they're right but it's rising from a very low base. So they realize people at $5 actually don't buy a Nestle product and then they have to scale down the factory again. Asia, again, story is different, not everywhere, but in many of those large economies. The flip side is, and the positive is, the number of poor and vulnerable will shrink, roughly again from the four billion today, remember the tipping point, half, half, a billion less. So you may wonder why a billion less vulnerable and two billion more middle class? That's asymmetric, no, there's a billion extra people. So that's the summary of this talk. <laughs> two, uh, two billion more consumers, one billion more vulnerable, and one billion population growth. But that's still three billion, 2.9 billion by 20, 2040. 
uh, roughly 500 million extremely poor, the SDG ones. And again, but you see here by 2040, you see the crossover. Then Africa will also dominate that group. That is in the in-between group. That's the dominant group. And what we as European would consider poor uh, is then, then that vulnerable group that would still be 3 billion by 2040. The big uh, news is this one here. The top three will stay the same. Every other move. So if you think again of soccer, of league tables, of any of your sports, you have a ranking, you have the winner and you have the loser and those get relegated. Um, you see a lot of things changing in the world. In, and again, but be careful because the absolute numbers are often not changing. So if you look at Germany, Stefan, my country, Germany really goes down. But the absolute number stays roughly the same, 80 million consumers. There can't be more. Germany won't have more people. But because others are move faster, the numbers go up. So again, the top three will be unchanged, China, China, India, United States till 2040. But then you see the big movement. And you see an Asian ranking now. You see Indonesia, Bangladesh, um, Nigeria going up, uh, uh, Pakistan being up there. And again, some of this may be surprising. Huh? The big surprise is Bangladesh, the fastest mover in the consumer class. Uh, Pakistan, a strong mover. Russia, as you expect, going down. Turkey going down quite a lot, but the UK, France going down, and, and South Korea being relegated. Italy also being relegated, um, while Philippines come into the ranking. All of this, again, a simple way to think, what are the top 20 consumer in the countries in the world? That's what we see them change, and that's what we can measure. And if you want the machine underneath, let me know, because it's available. Good. So coming to the end, which is very brief, but hopefully very special, because another big project we did with YASA is to measure emissions, which I, I'm not sure if anybody in this room here, but there's obviously Kevan Rihahi and, uh, uh, and the, the whole team are, uh, around, around him and his department. And you know they can measure emissions, but we measure it in real time now, and we get, give you a real uh, model to show how many emissions have we actually consumed. And uh, as of today, we are very close to 451 gigatons in 2027. We'll actually launch this machine tomorrow. I'll show you briefly how it looks like. So if we go switch again to that World Emissions website. And again, it's a simple visualization similar to Population I.O., similar to the poverty clock we built. And that's somehow an illustration of where the emissions are coming from. And the distribution that you see you know, the Austrian cows was just there, the, uh, the Saudi car, the American electricity. That's somehow where the emissions are coming from. And if you now go forward um, on the slider, you can make a projection what the, I think on the bottom, yeah, we'll go down as well. Let's go down, let's click on any country that you suggest. Maybe let's click to, the, uh, to a European country or just, uh, just type in Austria there. See actually how many emissions does Austria have? Uh, and is Austria actually below or above the world average? It would be self interesting. So Austria has 79 million tons, it's 7.4 gigatons. Uh, which is actually very interesting because it's exactly the world average. Um, it's exactly, Austria is at the world average, which, uh, sorry, no, 7.4 gigatons in total. Apologies, nine tons, uh, nine tons per person. That's the bottom number here. But maybe if you go down further, I'll show you something even nicer illustration. Just go down further. Uh, yeah, just let's type, you, uh, type on the right side Austria compared to the, instead of the US. So this is the concept, again, I can only do this very quickly. Um, what we coined is these two concepts. The, the, there's a total gap that we have, and there's so-called amb ambition gap and the implementation gap. And you have a total amount of emissions that Austria is having, nine tons per capita. And uh, if Austria keeps doing the way what it's doing, it will have a very big gap compared to what it promised. But it promised is pretty close to that 1.5 degree line. Um, the US is coming from a much higher level, double the US is per capita, but has a trajectory that seems to be going down <coughs> already. So if you click on this view sector comparisons at the, at the bottom of this uh, slide here, do you see it? Yeah, just go down a bit further. Yeah, this, no, no, higher up, a little higher, higher. This is, by the way, the business as usual scenario. So, yeah, now go down, now you have the numbers. So the, the difference between these two countries per capita is energy systems and transport. The rest is relatively similar. Agriculture is also low in Austria. But let's go to the slider and make a projection. Just at the bottom here, yes, and go forward. And then you see what the result is. So just go maybe a few more years, yeah. Let's do that, 2027, good, stop it. And um, okay, so the US, sees, you see, goes a bit down. You saw before that Austria is quite flat. If you go at the left side, scenario business as usual, let's go down, yeah, let's do one of them, 1.5 degrees. 
then Austria would need to be almost at half compared to what it is today. In the next six years, the US uh, slightly lower as well. Um, and again, so you see, the, you see the trigger. We did 24 sectors, subsectors, five big sectors that you see here, these big sectors, all the countries till 2050, and you get a lot of numbers uh, to, to do with this, and then new insights. So if you go back to the presentation, which uh, is now my closing, um, so we know we have a climate problem, we know we have an emissions problem, we know it's not going down, is there still hope? My answer is yes, there is hope. Uh, so if you go to the next uh, slide, uh, which is me, sorry about that, uh, next slide. So this is the, the situation again, some of this I just showed you. The world is emitting per person, so all of us, if we were average humans, 7.4 tons. If you multiply this by all the humans, you get to the 55 gigatons. Uh, and you see the distribution. Most number, energy is number one, industry number two. Uh, now, how are other countries doing? The EU is actually better than you may have thought. It's bad, but better than we thought. So it's 10 tons compared to world average of 7.4. By the way, the surprise is, it's not as simple that rich countries are bad and poor countries are good. Huh? There's South Africa, which is bad. There's Kazakhstan, which is very bad. There is Sweden, which is quite okay. So that's itself as a, as a little uh, input. But so let me then show you other countries. So the US, as we just said, 18.6. So the US is double the world, it's almost it's two and a half times the world average. Um, and as I said, double than Austria. But so where's hope? Why is there hope then? Well, here's the hope, because you can create prosperity, well, you can create a low emissions trajectory still with prosperity. How is this possible? Let's just take the best countries here, but the best countries from the OECD. So it's not, we're not talking poor countries. So the Dutch, seem to be better than us in transport. Obviously, lots of bicycles out there. So there you get a ton there, roughly, I think. The bridge, obviously, don't have so much industry, but have still, in principle, a good economy. Um, and um, that gives you another ton in industry. Spain, Spain is OK in energy. They're not the best, but they have a good mix uh, in terms of solar and, uh, and other sources. If you would put France or Switzerland here, you get even a lower number. This is two tons per capita, you would get one ton, but then you get into the atomic debate. Um, Sweden has hardly any emissions from buildings, and Korea has actually negative emissions on agriculture because of massive re reforestation. By the way, we did a lot of work with this team on the so-called LULU-CF emissions, also with Michael Obersteiner, um, which is, who is associated with YASA in Oxford. So that gives you a number of 4.7 tons. It's not a great number, but it is basically 50% less uh, than today, so 7.4, uh, 50% less, uh, ha it's half the EU average, it's a quarter of the US, and it's less than the world average. So we can just copy what the best are doing to already get to a way better uh, trajectory. You can do many more exercises with this, but I hope this was a little playful exercise with the data. Um, we have developed at World Data Lab a lot with Yasa, and I want to thank again Stefan and his team, because he was part of it uh, in many ways. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to run here. For some reason this is not working, but I would like um, also to press on. Um, I'm sure you have many questions. Again, we keep them for later. Um, the next speaker is Matteo Fontana. He is from the Joint Research Center, profi uh, op project officer there. And he is working in the Computational Social Science for Policy Center, which is really interesting. And he's showing us how to use new data sources, such as those from, for mobile phones, uh, mobility data, and, and so forth, on how to generate new insights. So over to you, Matteo. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. And welcome to my presentation of the title, Computational Social Science for Policymaking in Complex Systems. So my presentation will be slightly different from the one uh, that, uh, that preceded me, in the sense that I will tell you more about the story of uh, the Computational Social Science for Policy Project, uh, and basically how we decided to implement it, to mainstream uh, ideas from computational social science uh, into the EU policy making. So uh, just, I mean, very, very, very brief introduction. Uh, what is the Joint Research Center? So the Joint Research Center is uh, a Director General of the European Commission. And uh, our role, and my role, uh, is to basically be the science and knowledge service of the Commission. 
So we support uh, uh, EU policy making uh, uh, with independent advice and independent, independent evidence throughout the whole policy cycle, meaning from uh, the inception of a policy measure to its evaluation. Specifically, the computational social science for policy project uh, is uh, born and is incubated in the center of advanced studies of the GRC. Uh, where uh, the idea is, again, to incubate uh, research ideas uh, that are novel, uh, that are maybe not uh, uh, of current interest for, uh, uh, for our policy makers, but they will be in the coming three to five years. Uh, the, uh, so I belong to the Computational Social Science for Policy Project. We say Computational Social Science quite a bit during this presentation. <laughs> Uh, the idea was to have a very heterogeneous uh, uh, team in the sense that, uh, uh, so to, I mean, to uh, mimic and to, to be uh, receptive of the multidisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity that uh, a, computational, a computational social science approach uh, requires. So uh, I am one of the two data scientists of the team. Uh, my colleague Leonardo Bertoni is uh, an economist and a, um, a sociologist, so he's uh, covering more the social part of the project. And we have uh, also a data steward that is in charge of building uh, partnerships, data partnerships uh, with uh, uh, either, public, either the public sector or the private one, since data access and data access of private sources is one of the key points in uh, uh, in achieving this kind, of, this kind of experiences. What is the motivation, or what was the motivation of building this kind of, uh, this kind of project? I mean, uh, I don't have to tell you again uh, the story about the big data revolution, yes, the last decade, many, many uh, unprecedented cap capabilities of storage, of analyzing data, so uh, uh, we know, basically, we live in this, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have lived in this for, for basically a decade. Uh, we know that out there there, are, uh, there is a widespread availability of uh, digital traces that uh, uh, tell, you, uh, tell, tell us a, a, a story or tell us stories about social behavior, about social interactions in our societies. Uh, what, uh, what we noted and what uh, Michele, Michele Vesp and my, my boss noted uh, when proposing this project was that uh, uh, the use was uh, a bit lacking in policy making uh, and it was mainly focused, uh, so the experiences and the, the works in computational social science exploiting these uh, novel data sources were mainly focused in the academic realm. So the idea was exactly to uh, uh, mainstream and to try to understand how to mainstream this, uh, uh, these experiences and these uh, this, this works into the policy cycle. So uh, we actually decided to start from uh, quite far in the sense that what we decided was not to just delve into research, research, research and uh, uh, data analytics, data analytics, data analytics, but uh, we, we decided to take a step back uh, and uh, we tried to understand uh, either the, I mean, what were the, the, the questions that were meaningful from a policy perspective to be solved with computational social science tools. Uh, we then involved uh, the academic sector and so ac academics and professors uh, from, from university to give their take on these questions, and just and uh, after I mean after this uh, uh, elicitation exercise, uh, both from uh, the policy DGs and academia, we started to do to do research. So again, one of the guiding lights of the project and one of the main ideas in the project was to have uh, a. A very comprehensive approach and a very co-creative approach, so to speak, uh, along the lines of the mission-oriented research that was mentioned yesterday. Uh, so what we decided was to try to involve uh, the stakeholders uh, since the very, very beginning. With stakeholders, I mean uh, basically the, the, the supply side, uh, if you want, so the uh, 
uh, analysts, uh, academics, and people who deal with data, as well as uh, the policy-making world, and so this, the citizenship, the public citizenship, so what were the, the most pressing problems to be solved with computational social science methods, as well as the private sector as one of the main providers of, uh, of good data sources for, uh, for computational social science purposes. And the result was uh, basically a list of questions uh, that we published in a uh, science for policy report that you can find, I mean, you, you find the, the bibliographic details and you can find it and download it at the link or you can go on the Trello board and put comments on the questions where the idea was to uh, map the, what we call the demand side of computational social science for policy. So this list of questions, this, uh, 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 this, this book basically represents uh, what is needed by, the, by EU policy making in terms of uh, uh, questions that can be solved using computational social science methods. This book represented the starting point for the second part of the project, that is the handbook of computational social science for policy. So uh, we have taken the, the questions that we gathered from our colleagues at the GRC, from the policy DGs, and from the general public. We, and we asked um, a pool of experts, 36 experts to be precise, to give us their take and their ideas on, on the topic. So how to solve these kind of questions? Are these questions meaningful? Is it possible to solve them with the current technology or do we need something else? Uh, the idea of this book was to have uh, um, basically a, a guiding light for both policymakers and scientists to represent, again, a, a guiding tool for them. So uh, an interested scientist uh, or a scientist interested in doing uh, impactful research in policy in, with computational social science tools can use this book, as well as a policymaker who is interested in understanding what uh, innovative data and computational social science tools can do for, for his, his or her specific issues. Uh, the, I mean, the explored areas, I mean, we, we have been, or we've tried to be as far as possible with the coverage of uh, uh, the areas that, uh, that we've put in the book. Uh, and uh, aside applied issues, uh, and aside the applied issues, uh, we focused quite a bit on the methodological aspects, so the methodological challenges and possibilities that are offered by current Analytical, analytical tools and current analytical paradigms, but also uh, on the foundational issues uh, that uh, in, our, in our view and in our opinion are uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the most pressing challenges in uh, the actual implementation or the real world implementation of uh, computational social science tools uh, in policy making. So we have a chapter on the, enab the enabling factors for uh, CSS4P, uh, we have a chapter on data governance, so on data governance solutions uh, to mainstream CSS in policy making, but also uh, in inputs uh, on data justice and on ethical, on ethical issues. Uh, I will conclude my presentation with some of the research lines that after this uh, and after the publication of the book, uh, the, the book will be open, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot, I forgot to say trying to be as quick as possible. Uh, the, book, uh, the book is actually open access uh, and uh, it will be available, uh, if, you, if you Google it uh, and if you try to look it on, on Amazon, you, can, you will find it, but don't buy it because it's open access. And uh, going back to the, I'm sorry, going back to the applications, uh, uh, I will present three main applications with different degrees of maturity. This one was a relatively mature one that uh, we did, uh, I mean, when, when COVID was, uh, was, uh, was the, COVID, the COVID pandemic was still a big thing in, in Italy. The, uh, what, we did, uh, what we did in this, uh, in this uh, analytical, uh, analytical uh, 
um, experience was uh, to uh, evaluate uh, the uh, mobility restriction policies in Italy using uh, mobile network operator data. And uh, uh, we were able to quantify with a good degree of certainty the impact of uh, different tiers of mobility restrictions. But more importantly for policy, uh, what we were able to do was to quantify the economic impact of uh, mobility restrictions. Uh, something else that we are trying to do, and this is uh, ongoing research, uh, is uh, to understand uh, what, is the, uh, what is the impact uh, of uh, COVID-19 on uh, um, basically dwelling patterns uh, and uh, with, a longer, with a longer time horizon uh, on uh, urbanization patterns. To do so, we are using uh, uh, administrative data sources so basically open data from governments uh, uh, with respect to uh, house prices, uh, as well as via partnership with, uh, with, an, external par with an external private partner, uh, data on the uh, demand side of, of, uh, of houses. And uh, this is the last and most uh, uh, speculative, uh, speculative experience, we are uh, trying to, uh, alongside the, the, new, the new priorities of the Commission, so the, year, the coming year of skills, the 2023, the, the year of skills, we are uh, monitoring and analyzing the job market uh, in real time uh, via an analysis of online, online, uh, online advertisements. So uh, that concludes my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Matteo. Later on, the speakers will have the panel discussion, and you can then come forward. But there will be two more speakers. And the next speaker is Dilek Frasel from YASA. And she's going to tell us about SDGs and uh, citizen science and how citizen science can contribute to monitor SDGs with a specific example in Ghana. Over to you, Dilek. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me both Linda and Stefan to speak here. It is wonderful uh, to be here. I also thank online participants to uh, listen to this uh, great session with great presentations and also my presentation particularly. Uh, I will be talking about, as Stefan mentioned, citizen science data for policy decisions and action, particularly focusing on the SDGs. I really like the uh, question that uh, Matteo raised about how can we harness the potential of these data for policy making and for decisions. So this is actually also the focus of my presentation, which actually connects both presentations quite nicely. So first of all, I would like to start by asking uh, or telling you what citizen science is in the way that I see it. Um, so there are so many different definitions probably you've heard of about citizen engagement in scientific activities. So you may have heard of crowdsourcing, um, you may have heard of citizen-generated data or um, community-based monitoring or many, many others as well. But I use the citizen science, or citizen science as an umbrella term to describe all these different uh, activities um, used, um, you know, different, that are using different methodologies or terminologies to describe their activities. But in a very short description, um, there is no agreed definition, of course, but we can define it as public participation in scientific research and knowledge production activities. And this is a good example from a beach cleanup activity from uh, New Zealand uh, by sustainable coastlines. So um, you know this famous figure. This is, these are the SDGs. So I will be talking very briefly about the SDGs because this will connect me where I want to go today with my presentation. So we know that SDGs are a global call to action to address the world's greatest challenges from poverty to climate change. Um, and there are 17 goals, but under these 17 goals, we're talking about 169 targets. And under, under these 169 targets, there are 231 indicators, unique indicators, that are supposed to help us to measure our progress towards the achievement of these targets and goals. And, but the main question here is, how can we know 
whether we're reaching these targets and goals and where we are today and where do we need policy improvements and policy changes to make sure that we can we can achieve these goals and targets. So this is just one example from the SDG report 2021, but this, is, this hasn't changed much for the SDG report 2022. If you look at goal 13, which is climate action, uh, you will see that about only about 20% of the countries have data available to measure progress for this particular uh, goal. And even those countries that have data available to measure uh, progress, they do not have this consistently over time. So there's a huge data gaps in the SDG framework, and uh, many of these uh, goals and our progress towards these goals and targets are um, measured through official sources of data, traditional sources of data, which are household surveys and censuses and so on. Uh, but these are obviously not enough to uh, show us where we are today and where we want to go and how we are uh, progressing in terms of achieving these goals and targets. So, but we know that we cannot improve what we cannot measure. So what we, what we suggest at IASA and a lot of other colleagues within the citizen science community as well, new sources of data such as Earth observations, and we've seen a lot of examples today, but also citizen science can help address uh, these data gaps and complement many of the official sources of data to help us measure our progress towards the achievement of these goals and targets. This is quite complicated, um, but I will try to explain it very briefly. So uh, you, see, uh, you see here all these uh, 17 SDGs and next to them the indicators. And these are based on the indicators, uh, number of indicators that we, um, at the time that we have undertook this study, which was uh, 2020, this, when this was published. And of course, this is a, this is a framework that keeps developing uh, uh, when there are new data available to measure progress. So um, all these green boxes you see here are the indicators that we identified citizen science data are already contributing to the monitoring of. One example could be protected areas related indicators that uh, uh, biodiversity related citizen science projects are actually uh, contributing to the uh, measurement of. And all the yellow boxes here that you see are the indicators where citizen science data can actually help measure, but are not uh, uh, be used for measuring uh, progress towards these uh, goals and targets or indicators at this point of time. And um, we identify that citizen science data can actually help measure progress uh, for the 33% of these SDG indicators. And there's, uh, this means there's great potential for actually data sources such as citizen science, but these are not unfortunately being harnessed or used uh, officially. So we also identified that uh, four uh, goals uh, are the ones that, these four goals are the ones that could benefit from citizen science data the most. We also saw that, um, so there are 92 environmental SDG indicators in the SDG framework, and um, uh, citizen science data can actually help contribute data the most to these environmental SDG indicators. And these number of indicators are identified by UNEP. And again, according to UNEP, latest measuring progress report of UNEP that we have also contributed to, 58% of the environmental SDG indicators like data today. And uh, I would like to highlight one example for a concrete action about how we can actually harness the potential of citizen science data for measuring the SDGs is from Ghana. This is a project that we undertook um, uh, with the Ghana Statistical Service Environmental Protection Agency, the Wilson Center Ocean Conservancy, which is a global beach cleanup citizen science project uh, that are active in more than 150 countries uh, with uh, millions of volunteers contributing globally, and then local citizen science and action groups in Ghana that are actually using the scientific methodologies that were developed by the Ocean Conservancy to collect litter and data from the beaches of uh, Ghana. These are Smart Nature Freak Youth Volunteers Foundation and Plastic Punch, namely a few of them. Um, so there was a recent article that was published in uh, Nature Sustainability, not an article, sorry, it's an interview uh, with us and the uh, head of uh, the SDGs at the Ghana Statistical Service that actually explains in detail, because I'm not going to talk about the details now, and there's a paper that is currently under review to, 
to describe the results, which is very important, uh, and I will explain why. But this project was about leveraging already existing citizen science data uh, for measuring progress for the SDG indicator 14.1.1b, which is about plastic debris density. So we know that plastics are a huge problem globally, but we also know that measuring the number of plastics or the extent of the plastics um, in our oceans and waters is extremely difficult and costly. But we also know that uh, statistical uh, organizations or the national statistical offices do not necessarily have the funding to be able to do official uh, monitoring activities to address many of these different topics that are covered in the SDG uh, framework. So what we have done was using the open uh, data by Ocean Conservancy and also uh, the Earth Challenge Data Integration Platform for Marine Leader that was developed by the uh, colleagues at the Wilson Center with some uh, partners uh, in the US and as well as Earth Challenge Network. And uh, we integrated uh, the data for Ghana from uh, these beach cleanup initiatives by these local volunteer groups and citizen science groups in Ghana. And these data were integrated into the official monitoring of beach litter from 2016 to 2020 in Ghana. So the results of this was um, citizen science data for monitoring beach litter had been integrated into the official monitoring and reporting mechanisms of Ghana in a sustainable way because these groups are, they keep collecting data and litter uh, over years and they will be doing that in the future as well. Uh, which makes Ghana the first country to actually report on this SDG indicator because there were no country data available for this particular indicator. Even the methodology, global methodology for monitoring uh, this indicator was only approved in 2019. So Ghana has become now the first country to report and monitor on 14.1.1b, plastic debris density, and first country to use citizen science data for that purpose. And this data is not only used for uh, official monitoring and reporting, but it's also serving as inputs to Ghana's integrated uh, coastal and marine policy, which is currently under development. But one of the other most important things, we know that citizen science usually are happening at a very local scale in local environments, but this project also have helped bridging the very local level data collection efforts with global monitoring process by leveraging the SDG framework. So this could be done in many other different areas. We know that there are citizen science, citizen science is established in many different areas and particularly in the environmental and ecological sciences. And these data produced by citizens can help in many different ways in a meaningful way to monitor progress uh, towards the SDGs, but not only to monitor, but also to help action, to mobilize action uh, towards changing behaviors of people by participating in these activities and so on. And uh, we will publish the process of integrating already existing citizen science data for the SDG indicators, um, particularly it's focusing on marine litter. And um, uh, I'm, I will be happy to share it with you if you're interested, just uh, drop an email to me, please. And, just, I just want to highlight the key success or the key to success of this project was creating time and space because the national statistical offices are not really uh, aware of how to use or how to utilize the potential of these named data sources. We need to make sure that we're creating enough space and time for the national statistical offices and also for the very local level citizen science initiatives because it takes time to build trust between many different actors and stakeholders that are involved in these processes, but also we need to build common goals and ownership over the results of such initiatives. Just uh, before finishing, I would like to highlight that we are working now with the WHO on understanding the potential of citizen science for monitoring health-related SDGs and also the triple billion targets of the WHO and we identify that citizen science can actually contribute to 70% of the health-related SDGs and triple billion targets they're monitoring. And also we are working with the UNDP Oslo Governance Center to uh, help measure a social indicator because environmental indicators are more um, uh, prominent for, uh, for citizen science initiatives, but we're also trying to understand population, uh, proportion of population satisfied with their last experience of public services using citizen science data. 
And these are the, uh, some of the papers that we've published on this. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about all of them, of course, not today in this very limited time, but please feel free to have a look at those papers if you want to know more about that. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dilek. We are nearly through with the presentation marathon, and I'm sure your hunger is building up, though there is more to come. Um, last but not least, there is Gerhard Zwolba. He's data scientist at the, and working for the SAS company here in Austria, and he's going to tell us about citizen science work we've been doing to monitor the Amazon using latest remote sensing data and also to give us some insights about the Lake Neusiedl, which is here in Austria. Over to you, Gerhard. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It's a very big pleasure to be here um, in my presentation. Sorry. Uh, I will touch very briefly two examples. In the first example, I will speak about how we collected the data and how we did crowdsourcing. We'll sp speak a little about the uh, uh, analysis and how uh, the modeling techniques. In my second example, I will speak about the modeling techniques and how we uh, interpreted and how we made the results available to, to the public. Let's start with the first example. The first example was a collaboration between SAS and YASA, and it was a very big pleasure for me to work in this project over the last three years. I think the background is, is quite clear. We know the Amazon rainforest, very large, and a lot of deforestation is going on there especially recently, this, de this deforestation is rising. What we wanted to do, we wanted to implement a monitoring system powered by an artificial intelligence model so that not humans need to look at satellite pictures, but the AI model would take a look at that mm -hmm. and find out where is deforestation going on and how quick is that. The point, however, is to train such an AI model, you don't have the data available because we have the satellite pictures, that's for sure. However, we need to get labels on that. We need to feed some training images into the AI to say, this is deforestrated, this is, this is not deforestrated. We could have now uh, asked many SAS employees or YASA employees to do this, however, it would have taken too long. So what we did, we did crowdsourcing. So we created an app together, and in this app, we educated people very briefly with some examples what is typical human deforestation, for example, fields, streets, and a couple of other things. What is not deforestation, what you see in the middle, what are riverbeds, uh, areas where floods were taking place. So to see some pictures and to find this out. In this app, finally, you could uh, place your own judgment and say, okay, looking at this picture, uh, I would say that the, 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 the section on the left, there is some deforestation, there, the, the, there are some fields and some uh, other things um, going on. And in, in, in the right example, we see at the top section, the middle section, also human deforestation is going place. So this was an app which you could use on your smartphone or on your web browser. And we promoted this during our marketing events on social media, and we got very good feedback, so over time, uh, we collected more and more data. It's also important if you do crowdsourcing to give feedback to the crowd what happened. So if you started doing this, you always ha had a trigger how much square kilometers uh, uh, um, did I just uh, um, validate and, and uh, put into classes and also uh, with the assessments, how far is it still to go that we have a training base to be able to build our first AI model. So asking something from the crowd, but also giving something back, seeing what they have done and, and uh, engaging them. We made very good experience with that, and we, after some time, we really received back a large area of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Amazon rainforest and a large number of pictures to be able to feed them into our AI models. Feeding them into AI models, I would like to briefly explain in, in this flow. So what you have seen, what you see on top in the pink flow, this, would, this was the first try. We had some pre-labeled pictures. How far can we get with that? So we tried out the modeling stream. However, we found out we need more data. And this is what I just explained, the blue one. We provided the data for crowdsourcing. 
uh, got this data back, had an augmented a larger training set, and created a so-called Model 2. And this is also something where you can uh, estimate what is the effect of having additional pictures from the crowd compared to not having the crowd. From a modeling exercise, of course, this all goes down into deep learning methods where you, where you uh, train neural networks uh, in order to capture uh, what is on the picture and more precisely to, to be able to classify the pictures. So we had uh, uh, 43,000 images available. They were split into training, validation and, and test data. And we tried out a couple of uh, very prominent uh, image uh, re uh, recognition and classification models. And finally, the ResNet 18 performed slightly better compared to the others and allowed us to make a good uh, choice and, and uh, 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 to, to, to say we have a model where we can automatically classify whether something is rather deforestrated or not deforestrated. Of course, such AI exercises always have the problem that it's hard to interpret what's going on there, what's the background there. So what, uh, what you see in the left column, you see the original picture. Mm -hmm. And in the middle column, you would see how the AI model sees it, or maybe more precisely said, how the AI model deals with the picture and why it classifies it into a certain group. So you see, we see on the top picture at the uh, upper right uh, section, we see a field, a deforestation area, and we also see how different elements or the different pixels in this picture were classified by the AI model then uh, saying, this indicates deforestation, the other area, so red indicates deforestation, blue in, in, in this picture indicates no deforestation, to get a little bit in, in, into a look to understand why is the picture classifying something in a certain way and why not. We also see this in the second picture with some fields on the top. So we could, we could compare what was our model doing compared to what is the what has, the, what has the crowd been doing and how we can, we, uh, can we use and can we judge that. After, such, after you have built such a model, it's always important to validate the AI model because you would like to see, am I doing any good and can this be used in, in, in practice? So we found out that our AI model was able to uh, agree in 94.8% of the cases with the crowd on, 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 on certain pre-selection of the, of the data. Here you could say, okay, that's what we would like to have because the model is trained on this data, so it should be good on this data. What you see on the right here is that you have uh, 100 unseen pictures which have been pre-classified by the so-called GLAD uh, project, GLAD registration. So this could be used as ground truth, which is highlighted here in the small pixels in, in, in red. And the rectangles in gray or in red are the classifications from our AI model. Gray means no deforestation, red means deforestation. So what you see here is that the AI model was very good uh, able to classify certain areas uh, where deforestation uh, taking place and has also been um, confirmed by, um, by human checks by, from experts that um, that we can find this uh, very nicely compared to, to the gray areas where we don't have uh, s uh, so many uh, deforestated areas. So th this gave us some confidence that the model we have worked on really works. So the final product uh, then allows also an analysis over time, which is quite important, that you s not only see in green no human impact and in orange human impact, but also in red, recent human impact. Because different to if we did this now manually and classify large areas in, in, in the Amazon rainforest, we can now run this model also on a regular basis and also um, create the, the, the longitudinal axis into that. So that's the benefit of an AI model. You, you, you can run it automatically and do this in different points of time and you also have a more uh, objective classification. This was my first project, which I wanted to briefly explain to you. 
I'm happy to answer questions afterwards, and Ian is also in the room. I think he's even more an expert in this project to speak about that. I would like to briefly take you away from this room 50 kilometers east to Lake Neusiedl. So you see it here on the right-hand side in the picture. You can see it's a very, um, very flat land there, a very shallow lake. So this lake only has usually one meter between one and a half meter of water, and it's a little bit southeast of, of Vienna. The problem with this lake is it's bad water level over the last year, so it had a, a, a lot of um, coverage in the media already in 2020, but also this year in 2022. And I found this article, this is from Monday this week, where it says that the water level is still extremely low, still, because usually November, December, the winter months contribute water and not a lot of water is evaporating there. So this is also what, what still uh, uh, giving us a lot of solace. How come? As already said, 80 to 90 percent of the water balance of this lake is fed by rain, by precipitation. As we had lots of dry months over the last uh, year, so this already, the first warning was in 2020, but this year has been, has been even worse. So we see this on, on the left graph, the red line, almost no rain at the beginning of the year, then leads to the fact what you see on the right, that the, the average in black compared to the actual year in blue and the previous year in green, we see that we had that we reached an all-time low almost over the entire season, which is, of course, a very bad thing because if you would like to extrapolate this to the future. Citizen science, how is Gerhard involved into that? Gerhard is a passionate sailor and I am happy to recharge my batteries at the, at the lake by sailing and for, for me the thought the lake disappears and I cannot sail anymore is not something which I would like to, to think of. Um, by the way, the boat on the left and happy anniversary Yasa, this boat also celebrated its 50 year anniversary to this year so I, I thought I should bring a picture of that. However, uh, uh, collecting data there was easier compared to our first project because Hydrology Burgenland is doing really a great job by measuring this data, collecting this data, and also providing this data on their website for download. So what I did and what I uh, frequently do with my students at University of Applied Sciences in Burgenland, that we load the data from the website, we put this data together, and then create different analysis uh, structures some longitudinal structures in order to longitudinal analysis or cross-sectional structures to do analysis, which I would like to show you here very briefly. So one of the idea is to uh, uh, train a linear regression model that explains the change of the water level based on some other attributes, for example, based on rain, on temperature, and also on wind, because the, the lake is very shallow and a lot of water is being moved back and forth. This, this was our feature engineering based on monthly aggregates. I just wanted to quickly point your attention to, uh, to the yellow ones. You see I have average temperature, but I also have number of days with a maximum temperature above 25 degrees. That's very important finally to interpret the model or to put the model into, let's say, used by other people because we can hardly estimate whether 19.5 degrees is a hot or a cold summer month because we have no idea how cold it is in the night, but saying we have a month with lots of, of, uh, of, of, of hot days or, or um, lot for that's quite easy. So what, we, what I did, I trained a linear regression model and what you see here, this might be nice for us here in this room because we could probably relate to what it is, to the regression coefficients and so on. However, for the public, if you explain this, you need to put this model into life and explain it. So the intercept is the autonomous loss of water in every summer month. Minus, almost minus six centimeters per month, per summer month is, is getting lost. If it rains one centimeter, a little bit more than one centimeter is added to the lake. And one hot day, more than 25 degrees, costs three millimeters of, of water. If we take an example month, starting with July 1st, and we have 12 um, uh, hot days, means that we have minus our intercept. We have minus the contribution of the hot days, plus the rain, 
leads to a balance of minus 43. And this is quite a good way to explain these results to other people and to, to, to provide it to them. And what you see here, and in the sake of time, I will not run the animation, uh, we also provided this as a, as a, as a dashboard to, to run it with, uh, with, um, with um, other people and uh, to, to provide it. This is how you can get analytics to life and present it to non-statisticians and to non-data scientists. I made very good ex experiences after I've published one article at Medium and one YouTube at uh, one video at YouTube. I was asked by many people in the harbor in our sailing club, "Oh, it's so interesting what you're doing here." I could even understand what what you did. Maybe a last comment. You see on the left-hand side, this is meters above sea level. This is uh, the Adriatic Sea, how we typically measure high heights in Austria. On the right-hand side, I put a different measuring scale, which is uh, depth of the lake in front of the harbor exit, which is relevant to the sailors. So always when you present results, not only stick to your measures, but also stick to measures which they can relate. That's all what I tried to say here in time. Thank you very much for listening. Happy to discuss some more things about it. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Gerhard. I would like to ask all the speakers, and thanks a lot to all of you who have given us really great insights. Please sit here in front, just also Wolfgang, maybe you want to come here, uh, that we can answer the questions. Um, I would like to start maybe, if it's okay, with the people in the room here. Um, I hope we have some microphones. Um, is that working? Okay, yeah, there are microphones, excellent. Um, so, any question you have to any of the speakers, um, please, please raise your hands. You must have some question. There is a question here, Fernando, yes. Hello, uh, Fernando, thanks. Oh, thanks so much for the presentation. This question is to Gihard, the last one. Yes, I was I was wondering to know if in your model, deep learning model, you just well, we're talking about, uh, you already include a frame or an epoch in the model to consider before do the labeling for the pictures, uh, the historical data of the historical status of that piece of land before doing before saying deforested, not deforested, for instance. Okay. Uh the AI model just took a look at the picture, at the picture as it is at the moment, and was trained to differentiate on the picture, on the actual picture content, to differentiate between deforestation and non-deforestation. This was how the how the model was built. This information could then be used to compare it historically. Did this change over time, and also is is, is the classification stable? But the the model was just trained on deforestation, yes, no, based on this picture. So at the end, mm, could be an, a, a long history without this kind of deforestation in the final labeling, in the final label. So, so that's thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. A any other questions from the audience? Ah, okay, Ian, yeah. Thank you, yes, uh, Ian McCallum, yes. I have a question for Wolfgang. Um, uh, thanks very much, great uh, presentation. And just, just maybe uh, nice to hear a quick comment from you on the uncertainty of those numbers that you're speaking about for the, uh, related to the population in particular. Um, just a quick comment, perhaps, from you, thanks. Uh, well, no, thanks, Ian. Um, well, the, as Churchill would have said, numbers are bad, but that's a, these are the best in the world. And uh, right, there's uncertainty. You know, will will you know will we survive this week? There's uncertainty. Will we? I was just in Luxembourg because I was the wrong place. The navigator projected 34 minutes. It was the wrong number. It was 35 minutes. So there is uncertainty in life. It's always. It's part of life. I'm a big believer that it is very important to be brave and to present it with all the methods and that is the best estimate because that's what life is. We use a navigator, we make decisions about our family, about everything, and we should not have these, what I call the academic scare to say, oh no, it's uncertainty because we have paid too much to say 
everybody can always say like a parrot that there's uncertainty. That doesn't help anything, I think. But to say um, Bangladesh has a projection to have 3% poverty by 2029 under A, B, C, D scenario, and then you can discuss what those are. And again, this group here is quite, I would say, spectacular, right? You build the SSPs, the scenarios, they're consistent, and just having that consistent frame and then working with that is super powerful and just encouraging people to think about the future way more than about the past. We need the past, we need historians, very valuable, especially in the city, but the balance is wrong. There's too much history and there's too little foresight. And I think if your team and us can help in that, I think it'll be helpful. And then it's fine, you can be wrong with some of the projections, but uh, doing them and going through that rigor is, is very powerful and has helped in many ways. Okay, thanks very much. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe it's unusual, but uh, I have one question to my neighbor, or our first speaker. So uh, you showed us very interesting uh, analysis about how you analyzed uh, COVID and, and, and the spread in Ireland. Can you say something about these analysis have they been created in 2020 or in 2021? So what I would ask you, or what I would like to ask you, the political interest or the interest of the public, was, the, was there a peak in 2021 and now as things go a little bit smoother, did it disappear, the interest? Sorry, I have to take yeah. you up on oh, sure, sure. this one. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, also, thank you for your presentation. I did learn that by moving to Ireland, I now live an extra six weeks. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> I'm a great procrastinator, so now I've got an extra six weeks to put off making my will. But um, the, um, in answer to your question, that analysis was actually done more recently than that, and it was done in retrospect. But uh, I was involved with analyzing the data at the time. And uh, it was an interesting problem for a number of reasons. I think one is um, it suddenly became very immediate that we had to you know, work out a way of, of looking at this, uh, this data because um, it wasn't something we could think about it in the future. It was things that were happening there and then. And um, I guess some of the things that we were working with were things like calculating the, the R number, which if you remember was sort of the, the rate at which things were reproducing and um, I was involved in that. I was a bit petrified to learn mine was the one that was being used on, IT, on Irish TV and that um, it was actually someone else that was presenting it. But um, the, um, the, the point is, so we did have to you know, think very carefully and very um, um, suddenly about that. I think one thing I did also learn that was in communicating you know, some of the ideas we had to um, some of the policy makers and particularly some of the Irish uh, politicians, which was part of our job. It was always a bit interesting to see exactly what they came up with when they came out on TV, because we didn't know exactly what they were going to uh, say about it until they, uh, they, they did so. And um, I'd say I, I learned quite a great deal about that. I mean, I think um, going, going back, I think there are some lessons to be learned, though, in what I was talking about, in that, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, coming up with meaningful numbers to, to the general public. So we're using things like the doubling time and things like that, which um, were, I think, uh, quite useful tools. And also, I would say that there were issues in not just, you know, getting the ideas across directly, but, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this before, but about uncertainty, whereas I agree that, you know, we, we just have to live with the uncertainty. Um, I think there's also a question of knowing what levels of uncertainty there are and, you know, whether they are, you know, big enough to, to worry about or, or, or not. So, for example, when I was looking at those doubling times, you know, when I said it was sort of between about 4.8 or 4.9 and uh, 5.4, I think I said, well, okay, that gives you an idea. But you know that if you say the five figure, it's reasonable. Um, there are other times where, you know, for example, you've not known where something's grown or reduced and your uncertainty crosses zero, where you have to be more honest about, well, you, know, you always have to be honest about the uncertainty, but you have to address the uncertainty more directly. And I think the final thing I hinted at is I think um, uncertainty, and particularly in communication, is sometimes about the, the, the maths and the stats and data science. It's also sometimes about the language you use. If the um, weather forecast says there's a 20% chance of rain, um, do I tell people, you know, um, well, it's pretty unlikely to rain tomorrow? Or do I say there's a slight chance of raining tomorrow? And in the policy indication of that would be whether someone decides to bring an umbrella with them and you possibly take a, a different decision from the same numbers, depending on which of the two turns of phrase you used. Okay, thanks. Um, I might shift now to the online question. So we have two questions for Delik. 
Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase the first question. I just want to say thank you very much uh, to the online people for these questions. So um, the first is about uh, the mapping paper and the projects. And basically, um, the person says, well, a lot of this is about data collection. And do you know of any projects or case studies in which citizen science contributed in a different way than data collection? Do you have any examples? Yes. Thank you, Linda. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, uh, we've looked at citizen science in a very broad sense. So we were also including the activities where actually people are also involving and shaping the research question uh, on issues that matter to them. And a lot of these things are co-designed processes or co-designed citizen science activities. So people are actually not only participating in the project to collect data, like we've seen the examples of today, like crowdsourcing and so on, but they were actually also involved in identifying the research question or um, analyzing the data, collecting the data, or uh, even uh, communicating and disseminating the results of the data by even uh, getting interaction or having interactions with their own local policymakers at a local level. So we've actually looked at all different types of uh, citizen science projects under that umbrella while doing that uh, mapping work. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And quickly, the second question. Um, it says, it's about citizen science contributions to the SDGs at the local level, where data are usually more difficult to gather and less precise. Uh, I know that there are several studies about SDG downscaling. Do you know more specific works or practical examples that investigate this downscaled phenomena of citizen science contributions to the SDGs? Yeah, that's very true. That's a very interesting question, actually, um, because as I mentioned also in my presentation, citizen science is usually very relevant at the local level, but we were looking at how actually we can bridge this very local level activities with global official monitoring processes, like the SDGs uh, being one of them. But um, of course, uh, there is the um, localizing the SDGs concept. I know that you don't like the word so much, but uh, how can we make the SDGs local and more relevant to citizens? How can we bring them into the level of citizens that they can all co 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 contribute to? And uh, I know that there are for instance, um, the uh, Ghana work that I mentioned, it went into the official monitoring mechanisms by being reported to the UNSDG global database, but also Ghana's national voluntary review, or voluntary national reviews, they are called. But we know that also at the city level, there are voluntary local reviews where cities actually go to the high-level political forum of the UN and present their local level uh, SDG contribution work. And I know that city of Los Angeles is a very good example of that. And New York City is, uh, has a very good example of that. And they have reports uh, th that are online that you can all have a look into. But also uh, many European cities have done similar exercises um, to measure their progress at the city level or at the local level uh, for, uh, for the SDGs. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think Stefan has a question for Wolfgang. Yeah. Yeah, if it's okay for you, you can bear with us a little bit longer. We can maybe also have more a more general discussion, but I have one very specific question also to Wolfgang. One thing which struck me was when you showed how we can reduce our emissions, the developed countries by 50%, and I think some is really interesting, like we could all become like the Dutch and use cycles. That would probably work very well, but I don't think we can all become like the British because they have a very strong financial sector and they are hardly producing anything and the production is actually happening in China. So I think that is a little bit more difficult to tackle. Maybe you have also some thoughts about that. Actually, that, that was my exact same question. I wanted to say it's a great idea, but how do you do it? So how would I, for example, if I looked at Spain, the example of the energy, so that would involve transitioning, say if I was another country, my entire energy system. So I, I just, yeah, it's exactly the same question. Uh, no, no, excellent question. And maybe I'll add a final thing on uncertainty because it comes to this. No, it's, it's uh, obviously, I don't wanna, don't get me wrong to say that it's an easy transition, right? All of our countries are in this transition. My main point is you can be rich and dirty and become rich and less dirty. You will not be clean. That's the main message. And as you said, that in some sectors it's easier than others. And uh, what we have developed now, and that's somewhere out for you guys to say you have 
um, 180 countries, you have uh, 30 years to the future, you have three scenarios and you have these 24 subsectors. And this is like a gold mine that you can find those nuggets. And it's maybe not just about the Dutch transport sector. The big, big surprise was, by the way, what's actually in transport the big issue? The big issue you assume is cars, and you're right, 7% of emissions, but actually trucks and buses are 5%. I didn't know that, actually quite surprising. Some countries have a bigger problem with trucks and buses than with cars. So that itself, so some countries probably are quite good in trucks and buses, others are bad. And that was my main point to say you can actually distill those insights and those lessons, including the South Korea lesson, including, you know, like we should debate, I think, how Switzerland uh, uses energy, which again is even more successful than Spain. And then you get the right quantity to in that, uh, that transformation. As you, as you know, some countries like Germany have still too high emissions from energy, but other countries can, can handle. The, um, there's obviously a whole, you know, we are all part of this service economy, digitization. You can have cleaner manufacturing. Um, you don't have to be as extreme as the, the bridge, but, but uh, Italy has still a strong manufacturing in the north. They're cleaner than other countries. So I think that's a bit more that sense. That still, you have five tons. That's too high for the Paris Accord but five tons is not 20 tons like the US. And that's basically, I think, that gap in that debate that we, we should have, at least what's, what's possible and still be rich, because the other dialogue is let's stop consuming, let's stop be rich, which is not realistic anyway. And so that is a bit what this came from. Maybe just one final, because you, you commented on this uncertainty, which I think is still a very, very relevant point, and it comes to those emissions too, right? That's, you put the outer data out there now, there may still, there's still some uncertainty, let's refine it, but in being transparent, put it out and getting better data. The dilemma on this, on this uncertainty is, is then if you say, well, it's too uncertain, I'll not put a number out. Um, guess what? We developed the world poverty clock. There's a global number. We're roughly 600 million poor people. It's the wrong number. Why? Because we didn't include Syria. Syria we couldn't measure, but there is not zero people in Syria. The, con the implication, if you're too radical on this uncertainty, is you put a zero number. You put zero on North Korea. That's the wrong number. So it's better to have a different number, even if it's also a wrong number, because zero is, I can guarantee you, the wrong number. Um, thanks to Stefan and his team, and Jesus Crespo and us, we de developed a model for North Korea. We can now estimate poverty in North Korea. It's still a broad estimate, thanks to satellite data. But that's, again, the thing is, I'm not arguing you should be radical and just always come up with one number. But if you say it's too uncertain, I need to write a first 100-page uh, research paper, the implication is until you're done, the number is zero and it's the wrong number. And I think that we should always be aware that that's not a good, a good, a raw, a good situation to be in. Um, and could I also add to that? The other yeah. thing you know there is that not only is it the wrong number, but it's an underestimate. And uh, what you're trying to say is it's a high number. So in that case, even just saying that much is helpful. Thanks. OK. We, yeah, we don't want to leave you out, Matteo. We were going to ask you a question, but feel free to comment if you want no, to comment no, to that. Uh, no, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I, okay, we know there's a lot of data. And we, if we were to calculate the amount of data that were open in relation to the amount of data that's not open or in the, in the private sector, that, that number would be tiny. So I just wonder, do you see JRC having a role in helping to open up some of this private data for good um, I mean, I realize there are, are, are data privacy issues, and, uh, but, but do you see JRC having some kind of role in helping to, to, to open up some of those, those data sources as part of your, your computational social science project? Well, uh, let's say the, uh, the GRC is already doing uh, uh, pilot projects in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with the private sector for using private data in terms of, in terms of research and to help, uh, to help policy making. I think that the, I mean, the great advantage that we have uh, is that uh, uh, the, I mean, the European Commission is behind us and uh, in a sense, uh, you have, uh, or you are kind of solving the issues of uh, uh, reliability of the third party that is actually using, using the data. At the same time, uh, the current uh, European legislation on data sharing uh, is going towards uh, allowing uh, the use of private data in some uh, specific situations. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, the data act, uh, um, uh, no, not provides, but uh, it's, uh, I mean, in the Data Act, uh, you have possibilities for data sharing in case of natural disasters. So something that wouldn't require, like we did, for instance, for the MNO data, so a direct interaction with the MNOs uh, and, 
uh, and, uh, and let's say an, um, an ad hoc uh, solution for that, but something that is more mainstreamed and more, and more automatic. So you have a natural disaster, you have a flood, and you know that the MNO data will be provided to people who are interested in, in doing research or the services of the commission that are doing uh, situational awareness, for instance, and everything will be, will be, will be mainstreamed. Uh, another solution that is currently under, under development, and, uh, and that's, I mean, that's a very, very personal opinion, I'm not talking, uh, I'm not talking on behalf of the GRC, is uh, some kind of uh, uh, monetization of data in which uh, the, uh, the data producer, so the user, is actually re rewarded for it. So uh, data sharing platforms, uh, data, uh, data providers, and, and so on and so forth. I think that thing is, uh, is one of the ways and one of the most uh, possibly promising areas. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think we're coming to an end, but if um, you allow me to, to ask, ask a final question, which goes exactly in those directions, and it's a little bit provocative. So we are, we are seeing lots of laws currently, you know, the, the GDPR in Europe, um, and of course this is very useful, but the question is, you know, we are in very turbulent times and we need access to data also from the private sector, for example, from Google. It's actually urgently needed to tackle lots of global challenges and we cannot do without it. So is it not justified to make a law that some data has to be completely and open? Just to put that provocative question out there, some people would say, no, it's a public sector, we cannot touch. But are we not in such an emergency that this needs to happen? And shouldn't we pursue that equally as the GDPR? Over to you. Has somebody a thought on that? <laughs> I can break the ice. And again, it's a very, very personal answer. I'm not, I'm not talking on behalf of anyone. I would say yes. I mean, at some point, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a public good. So data is a public good, and as a public good should be, should be uh, put in, into a legal framework for, for that. So at some point, I, I think that, uh, I mean, as long as the private sector and the lobbying of the private sector will allow us, but uh, I, I see a solution like that. So uh, data seen as a public good and data shared as a public good. Okay. So... With that, I think we can leave it. I think now you're really hungry, is that correct? Um, I would like to thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations. Also, Linda for helping me to chair this. Um, and I think Linda, uh, thanks again. She has the difficult task to summarize all these things together because there will be a session later where a summary of this session will be given. So thanks a lot specifically to Linda on that. Okay, thanks a lot and thanks a lot to everybody who participated. <laughs>